The Thunderbolts project has grown into increasing communications with pioneering scientists in a great variety of disciplines. At the forthcoming conference, EU 2015, Paths of Discovery, many of these scientists will begin explaining the significance of their research for the Electric Universe community. The keynote speaker will be Dr. Gerald Pollack, whose remarkable research in the past has shown that water contains a fourth phase, which bears negative charge. Dr. Pollock is now exploring how the fourth phase of water influences the earthly environment, including climate and weather. In this audio interview, Dr. Pollock offers an introduction and preview of his forthcoming talk at the Thunderbolts Conference, taking place June 25th to 29th in Phoenix, Arizona. We started uh, studying water some time ago, and one of the offshoots of studying water was, was um, what happens as water evaporates. And the standard story about how water evaporates, we found to be um, inconsistent with evidence. Actually, it, it doesn't evaporate one water molecule at a time. It, it, it evaporates in huge clusters. And these clusters have separated charges, positive charges and negative charges. And of course, these clusters, they rise up, obviously, into the air. It actually turns out there are two species that rise. One are these uh, aerosol vesicles, we call them, or aerosol droplets that have negative charge. And they coalesce into, into clouds. The other is, is, are the positive charges. And they rise up, and it turns out that they rise high into the atmosphere. The atmosphere is full of positive charge. Uh, it's well known among the atmospheric scientists, although they, they really don't, don't do much with it. So one interesting clue um, that is well known, but I hadn't known it until fairly recently, is that these charges um, uh, during, during the time of daylight, uh, sunshine, these charges uh, rise high into the atmosphere. Well, the, you know, the sun promotes evaporation, and the evaporation causes uh, these positive charges to rise into the atmosphere. And since they repel each other, they move high up into the atmosphere, creating, uh, helping to create a huge electric field that runs perpendicular to the surface of the Earth. So it's about 100 volts per meter at the Earth's surface and, and depends a lot on weather conditions. And so what I found is that if you ma make this uh, measurement of electric field uh, up in, in the atmosphere, up above the Earth, it varies during, during the day, during the period of sunshine. And it varies not by 10% or 20%, but by a factor of 10. In other words, the amount of positive charge that piles up into the atmosphere um, rises or waxes and wanes uh, between daylight and nighttime. During daylight, high up into the atmosphere, you have a huge number of positive charges. But at nighttime, you have very few charges up there. So you have a big difference between the part of the Earth that's subject to sunshine and the other part of the Earth that's subject to darkness. There are lots of positive charges in, on, in one half and, and very few positive charges in the other. So you can imagine what happens uh, if you have a positive charges in one region and no charges in another region. Those positive charges repelling each other want to get away. They want to go from the region of high concentration of positive charge to low concentration of positive charge. That gives wind. It gives flow, flow of air, pushed basically by a charge gradient. So I think it's quite possible that uh, the wind that we experience, the wind it may be caused by gradients of positive charge. Nobody really understands you know, where the wind comes from. It's one of those things. Uh, I remember sitting in a sailboat uh, one day on a, on a lake, and, and suddenly a gust of wind hits. And I asked the question. I was a teenager. Where does that wind come from? And as far as I could see, nobody has addressed it. And I think it's possible that charge gradients could be a, a generic uh, driver of wind. Okay, so, so the wind blows, and there are predictable gradients that occur. So there are two regions between day and night, right? There's the morning region and the evening region. 
and predictably, there are going to be charge gradients. And I, I think that these charge gradients give rise to predictable winds. And so the morning gradient, uh, this is detailed in, in the book that I'm, I'm working on, the morning gradient gives rise to the trade winds. There are you know, moderate winds that occur primarily uh, near the equator blowing uh, from the east to the west. But high up, where the huge gradients exist, you're going to get a stream that blows from west to east. It's known as the jet stream. And that's why, that's why if you fly from Seattle to New York, uh, if you fly from west <laughs> to east, you get there more quickly than if you fly from east to west. These are reliable winds that uh, flow perpetually and flow all around the earth. I think that these winds that are, are high up are strong winds. And if you think about the frictional effect of those those winds flowing from west to east, you've got to realize that they're going to exert some uh, circumferential force on the earth. For example, I mean, the winds hitting the tops of the mountains, they, they push on the mountains. And, and so a, a simple idea is that, that these winds are actually uh, pushing the earth uh, in, in its spin, uh, making the earth spin from west to east. Now, again, that's another feature that uh, people don't, don't <laughs> consider. I mean, the Earth is spinning. It takes 24 hours, and we, we have day and night. But as far as I've seen, nobody has actually picked up the question of, well, what makes the Earth spin? Uh, the, the default explanation has, has always been, well, you know, it started to spin, and it keeps spinning because it got a lot, a lot of inertia. But... But, you know, every system has losses and every system runs down. And you'd expect that within a million years or so, the Earth would begin to slow down. And maybe in a billion years, it might stop. And in the four or five billion years of the Earth, surely it, 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 it must be diminishing in speed. But it doesn't diminish in speed. It keeps going. And actually, the speed fluctuates. So something is going on to drive the Earth. And I, this is an area that's not been addressed in, in any depth. And so I, I think it's possible that the reason the Earth spins very simple. It's because of these charge gradients that actually result in a force that pushes the Earth in the spinning direction. And that's really what I, uh, the, the, the essence of, of what I want to talk about, what I'm going to talk about in, in my Electric Universe talk. 